how much we've promoted it. God almighty. Yeah. So are you ready? Welcome to our little corner. We're at Comfort Inn, Upper Cornelia Street, Route 3, just west of Plattsburgh, on the 28th day of May, 2004. Skies were a little dark. The ferry ride was a little <laughs> rough and brisk today. But we're inside Comfort Inn, and I want to start out by thanking my friend, uh, our friend Jim Murray, for allowing us uh, the use of one of his rooms here today when we have somebody come from out of town, we'd like to impress them. <laughs> I'm so impressed. rather than meet him on the sidewalk, we bring him into one of the rooms and talk. This guy sitting next to me has been a dear friend for a long time, and we've tried over and over again to pick a time when we could sit down together and palaver. And we finally did it. Jim Millard, how are you? I'm doing just fine, Gordy. I'm happy to be here. Well, we are so delighted to have you here. For those people who don't know who Jim Millard is, I promise you, in the next hour and a half or so, you will learn. <laughs> and if you like local and area history from the Champlain Valley and either side of the lake all the way down to Lake George, you will get an eyeful and an earful today because no one, and that's a, that's a big phrase, no one has more passion for the North Country's history, this region's history, than Jim Millard. Uh, it's, did it start with you as a kid? Oh, absolutely, Gordy. Uh, as long as I can remember, I just loved local history. Uh, history, period, but local history, too. Were especially. you born and brought up in Vermont? My family goes back several generations in Vermont. Yeah, way back. And where were you actually brought up yourself? I was brought up in the Essex Junction area. My dad and his family, they were all raised on the old military base, 40th and Allen over there. Oh, no yeah. kidding. My grandfather was a horse cavalryman. Ah, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Got any pictures? I, only, I, I don't have them myself. I've seen pictures of him standing in front of a biplane and, and, and his, his gear oh, with the, the, the big broad big cat. Yeah, oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. But long time ago. Long time ago. So yeah. now you live in Grand Isle? I live in South Hero, just uh, real close to the, uh, on the border, uh, just below the ferry crossing, um, just as the crow flies right opposite Plattsburgh Bay. Sometime ago in 1997, you started to get involved with a website yeah. called America's Historic Lakes. And if you could have heard me squeal like a small <laughs> child when I <laughs> first discovered that and whipped you out an email mm -hmm. saying, this is incredible. Um, you've touched a lot of lives through that enterprise alone. Well, thank you. I, America's Historic Lakes obviously is very dear to me. Uh, it has been more successful than I could ever imagined. It, um, the internet certainly has a reach, which is just delightful. Uh, but I have, it's taken, taken on a life of its own. Uh, it is just something that has just grown and grown, and it's become very, very successful, Gordy. You're going to have a new fan because the guy that owns, one of the guys that owns Comfort Inn, who's allowed us to be here today, when I told him who you were and whispered tones over there and said, look up this website, America's Historic Lights. Good. It'll be, give me an excuse <laughs> not to do anything else. <laughs> so he's going to go in the other room somewhere. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Look up America's Historic Lake. Give us a, before we get into all this wonderful history, and you have just things boiling out from every pore in your body, um, give us a little background. Where'd you go to school? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, like I said, I've basically been a Vermonter. My family goes way, way back in Vermont. Uh, geez, uh, we're all, our roots are in Vermont. Uh, I've raised my kids there. I, my wife and I have six kids between us. Um, I went to Vermont schools. I now work at St. Michael's College. Uh, it's funny, Gordy, my background, it, I'm not a historian per se. I'm an accidental historian is what I call myself. Aren't we all, though, huh? Yeah. Uh, my background is actually in technology. All of my schooling and training is in technology. What I do at St. Michael's College is I actually teach the faculty or assist the faculty with integrating technology into their teaching. And that just works real well with my love of history. Um, so you can see the, the website is a natural result of that. So that's my background is history, technology, um, and you can see the result. But had you written anything of historical uh, significance before very, you started this website? The very first writing was on the website uh, back in 97. What uh, month? 
Oh, geez, that was back in probably in July. I had um, it's a funny story. I had gone to Crown Point, and of course, the ruins there are just truly wonderful. Of course, they are. Uh, both the English and the French fort, and it's probably one of my favorite places. I mean, Plattsburgh certainly has a, a wonderful history, but Crown Point is unique in that the ruins are. I mean, it's almost like a moment in time. You know, they haven't done anything with them. There's no recreation there. And so I took pictures, and I took pictures, and I took a lot of pictures. Did you picture Burgoyne standing at your side? I pictured Ethan Allen. I pictured, <laughs> I, I, oh, I pictured, I mean, the, the list of characters that have walked through those ruins. you got to feel the history, don't yeah. you? And the thing is, I'm a rather romantic person anyway. Aren't we and, all? You know, I, I, I go to these places, and I am there, you know. And so anyway, I took lots of pictures, and... Um, basically, I ended up posting them on the website, and uh, America's Historic Lakes was born, and I had basically released a monster <laughs> at that point. Isn't it funny how that happens? Yeah. Because some people yeah. would plan a website for years, yeah. hire a professional, yeah. pay a half a million dollars to get it set up, and then get three or four hits a day. Yeah. And I know how you get hits from all over the world, because yeah. people respond. They can. They can put almost anything in their little search engine and, and get on to that website. And once they do, it's the dessert. I was joking with Roger. I met my friend Roger Harwood today. Our mutual friend. Right. And he was telling me he was looking for something on Juniper Island. And he says, once I got through all the historic lakes stuff, he said, I found <laughs> something else. And I told him, I said, you know, I said, uh, that could probably be a little irritating to people who don't want to see the historic lake stuff. They've already been through there because it does show up a lot. Uh, granted, it's a large site, so it does show up a lot when people do searches, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, but there are other sites, certainly, to be found. It's a good thing you've done. And you can't, once you, once you created that monster that you said you unleashed on the world, it, you can't, you can't crank it back. You've got, your interest has grown even since then. And I, I'm sure our viewers to this program and other people who've f followed my crazy career over the years know that you're starting this wonderful website your great passion for uh, this historic region began to flower and explode uh, uh, coincidental to the time that I left the radio business really? and started doing this television show with our friend who's got the camera on his shoulder Calvin Castine with hometown cable so we're gonna track together it's exciting, Gordy. I, I'm certainly very pleased to be here. You're a local legend in, in, in your own right, and uh, this is wonderful that I can spend the time with you. Never mind the legend. We're creating, <laughs> we'd like to tell our viewers that we create little pieces of history every time we do this show. And a lot of what we do is historical. We spend a lot of time, we're recording this one day before the World War II Memorial yeah. is dedicated in our nation's capital. And there are several local programs, a couple of which we'll be covering on Hometown Cable. And that's historic. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time interviewing veterans of World War II. Yeah. We used to say 1,000 a day, now we're up to 11 or 1,200 a day that we're losing. Yeah. So it's very important to chronicle these events in the oral and video history that we can. You uh, have a very wide spread interest in, in the region's history, yeah. but you focused on some areas. Yeah, I, the, the, it's called the Lake Champlain, the subtitle is Lake Champlain and Lake George Historical Site. And these two lakes were part of this very, very important transportation corridor, Gordy, Gordy and uh, it's really hard to, to separate the two. Obviously, there are s certain areas on the lakes which played a more prominent role, Plattsburgh, of course, in the area during the Battle of uh, American Revolution and the Battle of Pla uh, Plattsburgh and the War of 1812. The Whitehall area was very important, Lake George, the southern end of Lake George. Uh, so there are other areas on the lakes which are certainly very prominent, but this corridor, this transportation corridor, this pathway through the wilderness, if you will, uh, really has to be taken as a whole, and that's why I had to take and do this, the whole scope of this enormous website. It's something I'll be doing all my life. You know, uh, I've used the word parochial a great deal on this program because I try to, you know, I'm an ecumenical thinker and I believe that people ought to 
pool their resources and their interest and try to get rid of some of these petty jealousies for what they do and share the knowledge and passion, especially for history. Yeah. And I was so delighted when the Chambers of Commerce uh, began to talk about the Lake Champlain region. Uh, besides focusing on the Burlington waterfront or the Plattsburgh downtown and so on. So the Lake Champlain region has give us a, given us a little regi regional area. There was always a little bit of uh, jealousy. S for some reason, that stripe that ran down the middle of Lake Champlain yeah. separated the two states. I think it's being erased yeah. as we speak, and that's a good thing for everybody's good. It's a it's a really good thing. It's an important thing, and there are there are a few groups that really deserve a lot of credit for that. I think of the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Absolutely, done a marvelous job uh, on, on basically helping people to understand that this basin encompasses both sides of the lake. Uh, reaches up into Quebec. I mean, it's this huge, wonderful area. Other groups, like uh, I think of Art Cohen and the Maritime Museum, Art has been instrumental in helping people to understand that this is our history. It's not Vermont history. It's not New York history. Uh, these boys that came and fought in these battles that basically did these incredible things on these lakes, they came from all over the Northeast. They were up here doing these things. So these are, this is our collective history. You know, it's not and I'm pretty, uh, that's, I'm rather adamant about that, Gordy, and I'm glad that you feel that way um, because we, we have to get away from this, this compartmentalism, if you will, thinking this is ours and this is, you know, it belongs to all of us. It's that's a good thing. Yeah. We, um, you've said in various times and places, live and, and uh, in your written words, that this place is steeped in almost more history yeah. than any place in the United States. Yeah. And that's one of the things with our little television show and all the things we do that we try to convince the local people to share this passion about it because we, this history is immense in this area. I've heard you say before uh, that we didn't hear anywhere near enough in school about this history. I discussed that before I came here today with other people where I work. And it did not change when you were in grade school, when I was in grade school, in high school, it was the same thing. We, we, we touched on it, did a cursory covering of it, but we never got into the, the enormous scope of the remarkable history that happened here. And I can't tell you the number of people that contact me after stumbling onto my website and saying, I had no idea. You know, and people that have lived here all their lives with no idea and so it's a it's a distinct honor that I have to, to share this stuff um, and it's been fun you know but it is it's, it's remarkable history and, and it goes way back uh, 1609 and I even touch on areas before then is whatever I can find out about the the native peoples that use this transportation corridor so uh, the history goes back a long ways and it was significant and in many, here. many areas. We've interviewed lots of historians and, uh, as you said, accidental historians. So many people who are very good at research don't have any credentials, but they've uncovered some pretty neat stuff and we love to, love to talk with them. A part of what we have here in, the, in this region is natural beauty. Yeah. You've described it in so many wonderful ways and you aren't the first and Calvin and I certainly aren't the first because you know, people who first, you know, outside of the Native Americans who were here, other people came to visit this place on their little uh, quests of discovery, described it in ways that we, you and I, could never do it. And on, on your website somewhere, I saw a description that I thought it was really quite beautiful. I got all, I got my little yellow, look at all that stuff. yellow pencil. <laughs> I can't I, remember. I bet you this was uh, a, a, was a member of General well, Fraser's staff, well, get, and he was off Cumberland Head. And he he looked around, and, and I can't remember exactly what he said, but I read it and I said, "My God, how could yeah. anybody?" I actually have it, and I, sh I should be able to quote it from memory because it's actually my desktop. There it is. But thank you. <laughs> I found it. Read right. it. And this is from a gentleman named R. G. Gleig, who was a member of General Fraser's staff in June of 1777, and he was a part of this incredible uh, invasion army coming down from Canada. And he was a Britisher, and uh, he was first time he'd been in, this, in the New World, and it was an incredible thing. He was, let me, I'll just read it. 
He says, here a scene of indescribable sublimity burst upon us. Before us lay the waters of Lake Champlain, a sheet of unruffled glass, stretching some 90 miles to the south, widening and straightening as rocks and cliffs projected and the most fantastic rising up into the mountains, now falling into glens, while a noble background is presented toward the east by the green mountains, whose summits appear even to pierce the clouds. On the west, mountains still more gigantic in loftiness, pride and dignity. And then he went on to say, I cannot by any powers of language do justice to such a scene. He did a pretty good job, didn't he? Isn't yeah. that fantastic? Yeah. Others have, have written similar things, but never that eloquent. Yeah. I read that and I said, yes. Yeah. The scene has changed a little bit now, but it's still the lake, it's still the mountains. He was off Cumberland Head, and he was looking over at the Adirondacks and the Green Mountains, and uh, it was in June. Uh, it must have been spectacular, but it really isn't. I, I, I don't know how many, how many times I go, wow, and I think, I'm seeing the same thing these folks saw. And of course, that's, like I said, that's the romantic in me. But when you look out on Mount, Mount Marcy or Mount Mansfield, you know, and you see the, the ranges, the mountains, and you can picture yourself as a French habitant coming down from uh, Montreal or, or St. Jean on your way down, walking on the frozen ice uh, to go down to uh, attack the native villages. Or you can picture yourself uh, in Champlain's little, little, little uh, entourage coming down. Uh, or these incredible invading armies, these massive flotillas. It's the same place. It really is the same place. And, and every time remarkable. we have a battle recreation, every time the boys bring something up from this on this Valcor project that we'll talk about, it's easy for me to be transported back in time. I'm one of those guys that goes to Gettysburg yeah. and just swoons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we do have a pretty good pictorial history of this region. Uh, from the early days of photography, yeah. Seneca Ray Stoddard took thousands oh, and thousands amazing. of photographs of the Adirondack region that survive. Yeah, yeah. Stoddard's work was incredible. I, I just can't get over it. Uh, marvelous, marvelous pictures. Uh, he obviously had a great time when he was going through here. He went through Lake George and Lake Champlain, and I draw a lot on his stuff. Yeah. So, how many? I'm not even going to ask you how many things you've written because I'm not sure you've even kept track of all the, all the little things you've written and the writing you do all, every day on your website. But now you've r written uh, how many books? Actual well, books. One book completed. Okay, the secrets of Crab Island. That's that's this that's one. In case our viewers have, haven't seen it. That's right. Um, the 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 next project, a very significant project, probably going to be three to four times that is my book on Fort Montgomery. Um, a very special project to me. I was just telling my friend Roger this morning, the challenge for me there is, is keeping it smaller, small enough that people <laughs> can afford to buy it. <laughs> that would be a challenge for me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's just there's so much to tell there, and there's so much misinformation about that. I'm having a ball. Um, but that'll be a significant project. And of course, all the articles on the web, uh, I've presentations, the different things I've done uh, for different newsletters and what have you, but the challenge is maintaining the website and keeping that vibrant and interesting and writing books and too. having a life. Yeah, <laughs> having a life too. I've got a very patient, <laughs> long-suffering long wife. I use, uh, my wife said, if you say that <laughs> Kay is long-suffering again, because uh, I've used that phrase yep. in connection with her for so many years, uh, but it's true. Those, yeah. those of us who do have these passions. Yeah, yeah. Um, they they have to they have to go along with us and you know all of my works my my books are dedicated to my wife because she uh, she puts up with a lot and she's been very patient and supportive so couldn't do it without her but you enjoy it and you learn things oh. every day and as oh. we mentioned before the camera started the secrets of Crab Island haven't begun right. to unfold there's so many more secrets that are gonna unfold as time goes on and it wasn't very long ago when Crab Island was well. Uh, Roger Jacobowski bought an island. Yeah. And you know, there's just a whole bunch of poison ivy out there and get us a goat. And they were going to move the monument and put it, uh, re erect it somewhere on shore. And just so many things that deserve to be talked about. But if we can serve up this history as you're doing so beautifully on your website and elsewhere, in a way that our young kids, will get excited about it. Yeah. And their parents will say, wonderful, he's writing and learning something about history. 
then I think we've accomplished something, and that's to get the rank and file interested in what we love. That's the most exciting thing for me, is when young people and educators make use of my material. Uh, I hear from a lot of them, and it, it's, one, it's particularly wonderful because we didn't have that as, as, as young people. And uh, I hear from kids who want to use different things in their projects and what have you, and I'm just thrilled. I'm just thrilled uh, because they are learning things that we didn't learn, you know, that we picked up much, much later. And I'm delighted that the curricula in many gr grade schools now includes local yeah. history. Yeah. And, you know, I was lucky as a young kid to have some one-room school teachers who were passionate about historic, the history in yeah. places I went to. And they throw everybody in all eight grades, you know, because there were only about ten kids all together sure. in the back of a van or a, par a parade of old cars and trucks and go somewhere and say, this is, you know, the Indians were here. The ancestors were right here. Or the battle was here. Or the shipping was here. And I, I remember those moments. And I've mentioned on this program, not to digress too much, but my passion in history was instilled by my father, who had an amazing sense of history as it's being told now. Right. This event sitting here today is a piece of history. Something will happen in the world today that's historical. Oh, sure. And when we lived in Westchester County and something happened, my father would say, get in the car. Wow. And when the Normandy was on its side and burning, get in the car. Is that when something? a plane crashed into the side of the Empire State Building, get in the car. Give him credit when for Shanghai that. When Chiang Kai-shek yeah. delivered a pair of pandas to the Bronx Zoo in New York City, get in the car. And these are things that are indelible in my memory. Yeah. You know what? We got to stop for a moment and make sure we get something, <laughs> getting something on the tape. Normally I would do this after three minutes, but we have so much ground to cover. Okay. Stand by, North Country. It's a high-class camera. <laughs> Calvin has to punch it before we <laughs> before we start from the break. Uh, uh, we've covered a lot of good ground when the camera was off. We always do, and you'll never know what we talked about. Except if you send a $50 bill and a stamp. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were. You, I'm glad you mentioned Canada and Vermont and New York State when you talked about regional history. Calvin and I have talked a lot in the past about this triangle of excellence and interviewed people when they got together and taken trips out onto Lake Champlain when all the leaders from these areas saying, yes, we have to pool our resources and our knowledge, and that's great. And before we started the, the, this uh, next chapter of this event today, we were talking about Fort Lennox and a lot of history north of that border, and not very far north of that border into Canada. And it's all part of our history too, isn't it, Jim? It sure is. Uh, Fort Lennox was, was built as a result of our constructing Fort Montgomery. And I love going up there. Um, the nice thing is that the folks in Quebec have done a wonderful job preserving their history. Uh, Fort Lennox has been taken very good care of. You know, it's like fabulous. a trip back in time. Uh, I was thrilled uh, with my last presentation in, in Rouse's Point on um, May 12th that three members of the Fort Lennox staff actually came and listened. and. Uh, we spoke afterwards, and they told me they actually took uh, some Get that information back with them, uh, which, which they'll change their actually what they've been telling the, the, the guests there, which was really a nice thing to know. Uh, but Lennox is wonderful. Um, it's, like I said, it's, it's very well preserved. And like I said, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, it's definitely tied in with this area. Um, that, the Richelieu River obviously was part of that transportation corridor. The, the two ends were the St. Lawrence and the Hudson, and these were the, the places where people were going. People would go from the uh, St. Lawrence down to the Richelieu. They'd have to take and do a portage across the Chambly Rapids, uh, where that wonderful fort was erected. They'd go down further, they'd go to St. Jean, where there's another enormous fort. They'd go down to Illinois, which was a major uh, British base, uh, right through the French and Indian War, uh, American Revolution, uh, War of 1812. Go down further, past the Isle of Nuts, uh, Isle of Illinois, uh, Isle of Nuts is what they <laughs> called right. it. Hospital Island, Ash Island, the Island of, Isle of Heads, which was actually named that because uh, the natives actually posted heads of their chopped off uh, enemy uh, <laughs> off the posts around the island. And of course, then they would come down uh, further south to Lake Champlain, and they're heading on down 
towards the great forts down at Ticonderoga, Crown Point, and Lake George. So uh, all part of the same corridor. And you know what? It doesn't cost very much to take a trip across the border with your kids this summer. Gasoline costs a lot of money these days. And these trips of, of historical discovery are a wonderful thing and 30 years from now your kids will thank you for having yeah. introduced history to them in that way yeah kids love the old uniforms yeah. and uh, and these places up north of the border and many places here too have have wonderful the uh, young people that they train to do the tour tours we were f so fortunate at the forts up there in canada so you know plan it if, and, and if you haven't visited there yourself take a trip their Take history is our history. Exactly. I mean, that's, that's exactly what it boils down to. I mean, they're all tied in. Just like I said earlier, the Lake Champlain is tied in with Lake George. So are those forts. <coughs> Excuse me. They're all tied in inextricably in one, in one big unit, if you will. I, it wouldn't surprise <coughs> me if there are people who are watching this program across the Tri-County region of New York and wherever it's shown who don't know very much about Fort Montgomery. And what a tragedy that is. But we're going to open the book today. So, you know, have somebody draw you a long, tall cup of water or a cup of coffee or whatever <laughs> beverage pleases you and, and relax a little bit because you're going to get a piece of history that is truly, truly fantastic. What's the first time you ever visited that site? I was just, to actually get on the property was just a few years ago. Really? But, yeah, just a few years ago. Not as a youngster? No, no. I, oh, I, what a shame. I couldn't get up there, uh, just like everybody in Ross's Point did, but I was a Vermonter. Um, but I remember going by that mysterious old place and always wondering about it. Of course, everybody saw it from the bridge, you know, uh, but I did not get to go there. Uh, everybody in Ross's Point, that was their playground. Rouse's point, the history of that old fort is so inextricably tied in with the, the psyche of that community, if you will. Uh, everybody's got a story about that old fort up there. Uh, but no, I was, a, I was a Vermonter. I lived down in Chittenden County, so I didn't get up there to play. So, so you learned about it later yeah, then? I sure did. You didn't really know about it as a kid at all then? No, I didn't. It was just this mystery. And I was told all sorts of crazy tales about it, you know. Uh, I remember my grandparents didn't know the story. Of course, a lot of folks have a lot of bad information about it. It's misinformation oh, terrible about terrible information it. about it. Yeah, and the same thing with me, you know, basically. Oh, that's, uh, that's in Canada. That's Canada, what you're seeing right there. And who knows why. <laughs> you know, it, it was just it was a big question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but there, there's still to this day a lot of misinformation. It's actually still being promoted, um, and it's... You know, we've talked about that before, and I just get this little segment of it. Uh, this is the technical aspects of history out of the way, because the Internet is a very convenient way to propagate historical errors. Yeah. And people do research on the Internet, and they settle on one site written by somebody who's another accidental, because you don't right. need credentials right. to be on the Internet. No, you do not. And so they'll write or do a speech based on that information and somebody else will somebody else will and the stories are embellished um, the mistakes are embellished and so we would we would urge anybody when they're doing uh, research for serious purposes or even to to tell a story to your family spend a little extra time and try to get it right if you can because how many times have you been on a website and you write down the information and you go to five more websites and you get different dates of birth and death days for very important people. It's a huge problem for educators. Yeah. Um, because young people love to use the web uh, for, for homework and research purposes. And, of course, obviously, using the web is dear to me. Uh, but with, if you are going to take and publish on the web, with that comes a responsibility. There's, there's a, a serious responsibility, especially with me with a site as large as I have. Uh, I basically feel very, very strongly that I have a, a, a major obligation, a serious obligation to do it right. And so when young people come to me, not only do I have actually have guidelines for young people, okay, use this site, but also use something else. I'll just be very, very careful. Um, but educators nowadays won't let, the, let won't the young people use website exclusively. There's just one part of it. They have to be a credible source. Uh, you have to look at uh, who, who's actually publishing the material. So it, 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 you have to be careful uh, because there is some bad information out there, certainly. A lot of good information. 
but a lot of bad information too. Just be careful. Yes. That's right. Be careful. Yeah. Let's begin. Okay. <laughs> you did a presentation fairly recently in Rouse's Point, right? Was it in Rouse's Point yes, or it Champlain? Was. No, it was Point. in Rouse's Point. And so you've spent a little time putting this together, haven't you, over the last few years? Yeah. Uh, you can't write a book without spending an awful lot of time um, perusing photographs, going through dusty old records, uh, library archives. Uh, uh, and I have been very, very fortunate in that people have uh, provided me with photos. Uh, they've been very generous as far as letting them into their archives. Um, and so I've uncovered some things that uh, I'm really very excited to share. Um, not only have I been able to uh, come up with a good relationship with the current owners of the property up there, uh, so I can spend a bunch of time up there, but I also have a lot of old, great old photos, which I'm anxious to share with you. I want to do it. So, Let's get into right. it. Um, do it at your own pace. Okay, well, we can, we can do that. First of all, one thing I wanted to, to do is... Uh, talk about how there are actually two forts up there. There were, when we're talking about Fort Montgomery and Fort Blunder, it's important to get right out of the way that the current ruins, what we know as Fort Montgomery, and a lot of people are not going to be happy to hear this, that is not Fort Blunder. That's exactly right. And this is an error which is pr continues to be promoted to this day, and, and so it's, it's important that people understand that it is not. There were two forts there, and these are actually some uh, slides from my recent presentation that there was not one, but two forts. Uh, the first fort uh, was only there for a, a very short period of time. It was indeed built in Canada. Uh, the, uh, after it was, this property was surveyed, they realized that a good part of it was actually built on Canadian soil. But it was a much, much smaller fort than what we have today. It was only an, a small octagonal fort. That fort uh, really was only owned by the, the United States government for about two years. It never had guns. Uh, it was uh, basically ceded to the Canadian government after a very short period of time. By the time the government decided to build the modern day fort, uh, Fort Montgomery in 1844, this was pretty much gone. Uh, believe it or not, uh, the legend is, and it seems to be credible, that most of it had been carted off to depredation by local uh, citizens. Uh, a lot of the modern-day buildings in Rouse's Point uh, have actually pieces of, of Fort Blunder, the original fort. And I don't think it had a real name. I don't think it was on the rules long enough to be... No, I'm sure they didn't... Right. Dub, I'm sure it was dubbed Fort right. Blunder, but that doesn't, isn't what right. it was called for the obvious reasons. And I do not believe it was called Fort Montgomery. And, no, uh, the, I don't the, think so. Either. No, the name Fort Montgomery, Montgomery, basically was added uh, when the government was naming what are called third system forts, a whole chain of them that were along the eastern sea seaboard and a few on the northern frontier. But there was obviously was a significant difference between the two. Um, this basically is talking about the crucial location that Fort Montgomery was built at in Rouse's Point. You can of course see the the Richelieu River uh, Valley here. And these are basically uh, places where there was a, 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 a battle, whether a significant battle or a small battle, uh, through, right from the French and Indian War all the way up to the War of 1812. So this corridor, uh, basically coming down uh, the Richelieu River, heading south, uh, played a critical, crucial role. And when people ask me, well, why build a fort there? What I ask them is, what's, what's amazing is why it didn't happen sooner. Uh, it, it's really remarkable that they did not fortify it pre previously that because uh, it was right at the very, very uh, border and right at a very crucial location. Um, I have a lot of photos uh, from different archives and I, I'm anxious to share them with you. Uh, this is, of course, the... Um, is that turned enough for you, Cal? Is that okay? Just okay. More? That's good. Okay. okay. This is, of course, Fort Montgomery, and this is from the actually archives of the owner, current over owners of uh, the fort, the Powertex Corporation, actually Fort Montgomery Estates. And in their offices up there, they actually have some of these photos. Now, this photo was taken from what is called the cover face here, and the cover face was a, a, is an enormous earthen embankment that was built along the western shore. And that was actually a part of a strategy of a, of a case of a, they brought siege guns in from the land. They expected the, uh, uh, an invading force to come down the river. But in the unlikely event that they did come in from land, this enormous embankment would have, was built to prevent this western, uh, protect this western face. 
this is a, a truly marvelous photo right here. Uh, this is from actually, I took this from a glass can slide. We, I don't can know if we you can lift see that up that, a little Calvin. bit? Yeah, sure. Um, this is probably one of the earliest photos taken of the fort. It shows wonderful uh, how that little bridge that was oh across the moat. Oh my goodness, I've never seen that before. Right. Uh, this is taken on the uh, northeast, uh, that the northwestern bastion looking down over the moat. Wow. And one popular misconception, and other people are going to be disappointed to hear this too, is that was not a drawbridge. People tend to want to believe that was a drawbridge, and I can understand why they would think so. But it was actually a very small, I believe, a temporary bridge. Uh, when they actually brought the equipment in for the fort, the heavy guns and what have you, they actually came in the other door. This was a small bridge that was designed, basically, I believe, to be taken out by these flank howitzers here if there was ever a need, but they could just, oh, just right, take that right <laughs> out. Just one blast. That's right. Yeah, yeah. What would have to happen in an invading army, they have to come up, up the cover face down, descend to the moat, and then try to get in here. The water level is actually 15 feet below the entrance to the oh, fort. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so that was actually quite a strategy uh, to build it that way. This is just another picture from um, actually the Champlain story of Mr. Gilpin uh, showing uh, the rifle loopholes or what have you, the slots on that western face. This is another wonderful picture from a glass slide. This is very unique. You can see the water spots and what have you on it. But it really shows uh, the, the uh, casemates that each of these actually would have had a cannon in it. Yep. The lower sections was, a, was a, for barracks and storerooms. But one of the unique features of this fort is they actually had these wonderful circular stone stairways, and we'll see some pictures of them later on. But early on in the history of the fort, these uh, wooden structures that protected the, the, uh, the stairways from the elements were on top of them. And it's very, very rare to find photos with those structures still there. So I'm actually very excited to see uh, a photo with those those t up top. We don't know when this would have been taken. But this is probably was taken, I'm guessing, 1901 or 1902. Ah, yeah. Okay. A lot of the wood is still there. Um, you can see it's you know what it's, it's not a great quality photo, but it does tell us a lot. And this is the interesting feature about this. This is the wall that's still standing. Yes. Yeah. So this is actually the south curtain or that main wall that you ah, still have. So it. that's the I section that's still there. This is a photo that's been published uh, a fair amount. Uh, this is another early photo looking in uh, towards, uh, towards the east. Uh, these, this would have been a, star, a spiral staircase inside here. This is the eastern, uh, let's see, these are casemates, and this is actually the eastern bastion. So this was the, uh, that furthest point there. We'll keep this out. This is the East Bastion, so we're actually looking towards, we're on the parade ground looking in ah. towards this Eastern Bastion. Each of these are casemates, as you can see there. These are some other photos of the inside of the fort, the different uh, views of the casemates uh, across the parade ground. Just more of the same. Of course, there were glass in these windows, the glass uh, and the wood was... was glass even then? Oh, sure it was. And that's about a hundred years ago. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. unbelievable. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, these, uh, this is, these were the, the business end of the fort, if you will. I've seen um, this photograph. Yeah. Oh, Can one I of the... show it a little bit? Sure. Because that's kind of significant. Those are the gun emplacements. Oh, sure they are. And another big yeah. misconception... That's Another big misconception of the fort, and this again is being promoted even to this day, is that there were never any guns at Fort Montgomery. That is not true. There were never and, any, any and guns at Fort Blunder. That's right. There were never any guns at Fort Blunder, but Fort Montgomery was, it did never, it never had its full emplacement of guns. It was basically, it was meant to hold up to 125 guns. Uh, I've got copies of military documents that show, uh, probably around 1886 at the most, it had something like 76 guns. So, and these were enormous Rodman cannons and 32-pounder Columbia, so it definitely had guns. And he survived, do you think? Uh, most of them were removed by 1902. I believe most of them did not survive World War I and World War II, where they were melted down for... I just, I want to see one! Scrap drives. I yeah. wonder if one survives. Probably not. You haven't discovered it. The closest, the closest things you could see to what these guns actually, I have pictures, but there's a there's a Rodman in on a green in Middlebury, Vermont. Well, oh, there is. Right. I'd okay. love to know the provenance of that. I mean, oh, wouldn't I, that be oh, bizarre? Oh, that would be something. 
Um, Knowing how you operate, Mark, <laughs> somebody probably carried it down there so you'd discover it. But uh, that would be wonderful. But, I mean, it's, it is the same type of a gun. But as you can see, uh, these are called traverse circles, and these enormous guns would, would, would swing on these circles, and each one of these would have held one of these cannons. Um, this is uh, another view, a wonderful view. This is from my friend Charlie Barney, uh, who is a Rouse's Point native, who's provided me with some wonderful photos of late. Um, showing a truly remarkable photo of an individual standing right at the what was called the, the Sally Port or the postern, the entrance to the fort, the western entrance. And here's across the bridge. You can see it's not a drawbridge, but he's actually right there. Uh, Charlie's basically thought of it that basically the guardian of the fort, if you will. You know. Don't you love it? You yeah. got to tell. Yeah. You're, are you ready to tell the the Barney story now? Sure. Sure. Why not today? Um, we wanted to do it before we forgot it, so this is a good time. The, uh, the, having a, a website can be a blessing and a curse because you hear from all <laughs> sorts of people, and it's wonderful. Um, but a lot of people ask you for things that you just can't possibly provide. You know, you have to say no to a lot of people. But also you hear from people who have things they want to share. And Charlie Barney is a person who, was, like I said, was raised in Rouse's Point. Uh, his father was a... Uh, Rouse's Point policeman. Uh, he actually worked at, for the DNH for a while as a policeman. He was a, uh, a World War II veteran, took uh, remarkable photos of uh, some terrible things he saw at the camps in, 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 uh, in Europe. But he also uh, spent a lot of time taking pictures of Fort Montgomery, where he and his kids played as, as when they were growing up. And he shared these wonderful photos with me. But anyway, the, the long story short is, is Charlie actually has uh, a musket. This uh, is beautiful. Yeah, a, a musket that his father found in 1950 or 51 on the grounds of the fort. His father was actually doing target practice there. And at first I was skeptical, you know, because I had, I, 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 knew, there were, I knew there were cannons there. Yeah. But it never dawned on me that there was actually would have been an armory with small arms there. So we looked at the cannon, we did some, re uh, the, or musket, we did some research, and sure enough, it was an 18 well, eight, eight war, basically an 1816 model a military army, U.S. Army musket that was basically um, remanufactured in the 1850s. So it's almost certainly a gun from Fort Montgomery. And how would it escape notice until that time? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that amazing? It truly is. What it kind of shape was it? In? It's it's not in great shape. I mean, it's 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 certainly rusty. Um, it's all there. The bayonet, of course, is gone. Uh, the uh, powder horn is there, um, and it's certainly you can identify it for what it is. And as Charlie was growing up, he actually would take and display this at school. Uh, I'm sure a lot of his take a musket yeah. to school. Right? Can you yeah. imagine today when no. a kid can't even yeah. bring a nail fire to right. school? Well, those are different times, oh, as, as you know. Oh boy! Um, but it was. Uh, it that was must a, have been quite a show and tell for yeah. Charlie, huh? Yeah, but he's been very generous with not only with he brought that to the uh, May 12th presentation, and he also has been. As we go through here, you'll see some truly remarkable photos he shared with me that his father took uh, in the uh, 30s. I love of it. The That's fort. such a great story to me, not only to, to see that musket, yeah. but to have it survive all those years yeah. just laying on the ground somewhere where somebody dropped it. And the thing is, Gordy, is, is even though there was never a real garrison there, uh, the garrison, the closest garrison was at Plattsburgh. Yeah. Um, the there were construction battalions that were actually drilled and they were uh, quasi-military battalions. And these groups actually would scale the guns, they would practice firing the guns, particularly during the Civil War when things were very, very, uh, let's just say, uh, interesting. Um, so they would actually have to have something to drill with. And yeah. so obviously these people would be assigned during these times, uh, these, these, these uh, small arms. Uh, and it never, it's just a piece of history I never thought about. Um, so it's a remarkable thing that he actually has this guy. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm so okay. glad we got sure. that story in. Sure. All right. Uh, look, continuing on, this is a little bit harder to see because what they did is they... Turn it a little more okay. for Kelvin, yeah. This is uh, one of those rare photos that actually shows the entire fort from the water. Um, this is from the collection of the Feinberg Library, uh, special collections, and it shows looking towards uh, the East Bastion, but you can see it's a rare photo showing the main entrance, if you will, the main, as far as I'm concerned, from the water, because the the cannons and what have you, uh, all of the supplies of the fort would have been brought in. There was a huge wharf right here. You can see part of it, 
Everything came in that way because it could not get across this little rickety bridge here. So the barges and what have you would come up and they would bring all the uh, weapons and what have you in through that one entrance there. And a lot of people don't realize that that entrance was, uh, there was an entrance on the lake side. So you think these are all early 1900s, so the, the fort would have been like 60 years old right. at that time. Absolutely. And you can tell a lot by, uh, by looking at the roofs. Uh, here we can see just bits and uh, pieces of, of the um, structures that were over the staircasings. Uh -huh. So that's pretty much how I date these photos. Great. Yeah. They disappeared early on. Uh, these are photos um, showing uh, the parade ground. As you can see the wood has been removed from all of the uh, oh. casemate doors and from the barracks here. The doors and the windows have all been removed. This entire western face, which was called the gorge face or the back of the fort, um, was very, very different in that it was just uh, set aside for rooms. This was the main barrack section of the fort. It did not have uh, cannons in it. There were, it was planned to have cannons along what's called the barbette tier, which was the top. But this particular section here, and you can see the poster in there, this was the entrance to the parade ground from the, from the drawbridge. Um, this is uh, uh, rather a wonderful picture. And you can see it was a very different character, this wall, from the rest of them. Uh, people have always enjoyed Rouse's Point and the fort in particular. Uh, more pictures from Charlie Barney. He tells me this oh, individual is man. still alive. Come on. Uh, he tells me he lives in the Albany area. Um, I can tell you that uh, this is very dangerous from a, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's very, very high. But that flagpole had been there a long time. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, you tell me. That's right. 1933. 1933. I don't know how long Mr. Fitch was up there. Um, but um, I don't know much about flagpole sitting at all. I can't imagine they'd want to spend there too much time up there. It looked there, to me like it would be painful after about 30 or 40 <laughs> seconds. So I hope he didn't stay for days. All I can say is he must have had a heck of a view. Charles Fitch. <clears throat> yeah. The name somehow rings a bell with me. We'll yeah. have to do... Yeah. A little more research. Wouldn't that be wonderful if he still Actually were? talk with the gentleman, sure. Okay, we got the flight yeah. pole, Charlie. Can you make it to the top again? Rouse's Point residents have always gone into the fort. They've always considered it to be their own, and so I think that's one of the reasons it's so hard for them nowadays to not be able to go in there, and we'll talk about a little reason why they can't. But this woman actually went in through the moat, and she went in through one of these uh, house, uh, flank howitzer emplacements. You can see how she was dressed, as she was at the time. But I actually have other photos you can see if they blow them up of her walking through the fort with her friends later on. And this here was actually taken in uh, 1932, I believe it is. Uh, but she basically grouses about uh, how wonderful the fort was and how they took it down uh, later on. And we'll talk about the destruction of it. But uh, she went in and she talked about how wonderful the, uh, the architecture was and the brickwork and what have you. And um, people always, here's another photo. Now these were some of Charlie Barney's relatives. Um, they'd have picnics on the parade ground and what have you. Uh, it, it certainly played a, a key role in uh, many, many people's lives. Uh, this is not an interesting photo of itself, except they're sitting on one of the fort walls. This is Charlie's father, the Charlie Sr., uh, the Rouse's Point policeman. Uh, in this photo here, taken uh, towards uh, the southeast bastion, you can see the people in the windows. Uh, one of these women is the woman we saw earlier. Oh, really? That's right. One of them is and there's another woman holding a baby here. Uh, this is the part of the fort that is still intact. Um, when I say intact, I, I say that rather tongue-in-cheek because it's uh, the ruins are deteriorating fast, but uh, that's what you can still see from the bridge. The interesting thing about this photo is if you can see these were called third system forts. Uh, it was a, a, a major uh, military expenditure at the time. It went on for 30, 40 years. And as these forts were built over, the Fort Montgomery took a good 30 years to build. But as these forts were built, they would incorporate new technology as they went along. You notice the, these are for the same type of guns. You notice the very bottom tier has brick, em, brick embrasures. The top have a masonry embrasures reinforced with iron bands. They built the lower section and then later on they decided, well, this is going to be a much better uh, technology, so they actually used what are called totten embrasures up top. So you can see that as the years went on, they actually would incorporate new technology into the building of this fort. So. Um, these are just some more photos of that same face, the face that we see below. You can see the bridge here on the moat. 
You can see the ruins of the um, uh, wharf or, or dock that was there. This is where the stone was brought in from the King's Bay and uh, Isle of Mont quarries. Uh, you can see the very tops of the structures that were over the, uh, the staircases. These photos here are from the Clinton County Historical Archives. Uh, this is the uh, north uh, face of the fort. This is completely gone now. This was destroyed in the 1930s, 1937 demolition. Uh, this photo we're going to come back to later because I, have, I want to show you what this photo, this area looks like today. But you can actually see that this was the very first part of the fort that was built. And the clue of that is that they have the old embrasures top and bottom. They didn't incorporate the newer ones later on this. So you can tell a lot by looking at the photos. Just some more photos of this the massive size of the fort. You can see the huge cover face here. And it was a gargantuan fort. It was a mid-size for uh, a third system fort, but it was a gargantuan fort for the area. It was really huge. More photos of that face. Um, this is unique for several reasons. I love it. Yeah. It's unique for several reasons. First of all, because it shows the, the wonderful stone uh, circular stone, uh, self-supporting stone stairways, but also shows that uh, people went there with their families. Um, why they propped Junior up there on a stair, I don't know, but uh, it does tell us a lot. Um, you can also see the supports. Can't you hear Mom saying, I can't carry that yeah. kid another yeah. inch? Yeah, she's going to sit right there, we're going to take a picture, and I'm going to get a load off my arms <laughs> for a few minutes. Yeah. That's really great, though. Yep. What a great shot. I've yep. never seen that before. Yep. yep. And, uh, of course, this was after these structures were removed from the very top uh, to protect them from the elements. Oh, There's, great shot. Yeah, some more photos of those, those sta staircases. And these allowed the, uh, the defenders to go from the parade ground level up to uh, the second tier, the casement level, and where the heavy guns were, up to the barbette tier, which was the very, very top. Now these are actual plans. Uh, these are uh, rather remarkable. This is the actual plan of the very first fort, Fort Bunder. You can see that the size of it on, yes. the, on the island, that it did not take up the whole island. This is where the modern day bridge would go today. There was a small redan there. You can see a few issues uh, of, of profiles of what the actual fort looked like. To my knowledge, there's never been any sort of a real drawing made of what this fort looked like. We know it was very, very different from Fort Montgomery. And I have a uh, a new acquaintance, another person I met through the, through the internet, who is basically an architect. And I've sent him this plan, and I've sent him this plan from the War Department from 1816. And here's what we've come up with. This is still in the oh, works. Now, yeah, this isn't is, this fantastic? This is still in the works. This, is, this is a preliminary this. sketch. But we'll have, by the time the book comes out, we'll have a much better uh, a more accurate photo, but this is, for all intents and purposes, what Fort Blunder looked like. I love it. We stopped for a moment after seeing that delicious picture. I love it. Because Calvin said, we better tell people about the boundaries before yep. and after the, the Battle of Plattsburgh War of 1812 and why uh, it was Fort Blunder and why Fort Montgomery wasn't in Canada and the yep. whole thing. So. Just give us a little primer here, Jim. That's a good point. The, of course, immediately after the War of 1812, uh, tensions were still very, very uh, high between Britain and Canada and uh, United States. And the War Department did decide they were going to build a fort at this crucial location. Uh, they made a serious error, uh, a couple of them actually. One of them was uh, they built this fort on a very poor foundation that you brought debris up from the Battle of Plattsburgh forts. So the fort actually started to sink into the uh, uh, lake because no sooner it was built. In, but the main blunder, and the one that people talk about today, um, and that it continued right on and it's hanging over Fort Montgomery, was the fact that this fort was actually built in Canada as a result of a surveying error. Uh, the 45th parallel had traditionally been recognized as the border between Canada and the United States. And there were a lot of disputes about that, primarily in Maine. Um, the United States and Britain almost went to war over oh, yes. the Maine property area uh, uh, disputes. And it went back and forth and back and forth. And like I said, finally in, in 18, 1819, the latter part of 1818, uh, they decided that, yeah, okay, we built the fort in Canada. Gave it to, they ceded that property uh, to um, Canada. 
It wasn't until 1842 when the Ash Webster Ashburton Treaty finally resolved these border disputes, moved the border north of the 45th parallel. People don't realize that. It actually was moved north a little bit. Took care of all the mess in Maine. Uh, <laughs> took care of uh, a lot of the tension that was brewing between Britain and the United States that the United States got Island Point back. It was when two years later they started Fort Montgomery. So it was uh, a, a big deal. Um, we did build a fort in Canada, and there's no two ways about it. I mean, you know, uh, it's interesting that this, this actual map here was actually a British map. Uh, that um, the B dot O with the broad British broadhead, uh, they're basically drawing a map about their newly acquired fort uh, that the United States graciously built for them. Uh, so that was the blunder. That was the blunder. Um, but it's it's real important to differentiate between the the latter fort, the more modern fort, Fort Montgomery, which was constructed after the border was moved in 1844. Uh, the border was changed in 1842. Uh, that is not Fort Blunder. Fort Blunder was this, this fort we talked about earlier, uh, the one that uh, Ar Arthur Tremblay is actually uh, drawing this, this uh, wonderful sketch about. Calvin keeps us on track. He stopped the camera again to tell us there is an actual marker in Rouse's Point. By what avenue? By what street? Off Rose, Rose, Avenue. Rose Avenue, which shows where the original boundary was, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the people hopefully will inspire families to do what I said before, get out. Look for these historical, there's a lot to be learned just by stopping when you see a historical marker along the roadside where there was an old church or a school or a fort or a, you know. Absolutely. So. Uh, yeah, the, that marker is wonderful to see. Um, again, a, a trip to Rouse's Point is fascinating in itself because of the, you can see the buildings. You can, like I said, Fort Blunder still lives in some of these old buildings. Um, I'm convinced that a lot of uh, locals up there still have pieces of these forts in their homes too. You know, uh, it's a good point that you mention here, because those of us who are trying to discover and preserve the history of our area uh, rely a lot on those people like Charlie yeah. who go into a, a drawer or a basement and drag out an old musket or a photograph. And it's, 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 it is, I mentioned it as dessert before. It's for you and me, this is, the dessert after a wonderful meal. You study the history of this fort. People bring these photographs and you say, oh my goodness. And there are lots of these treasured photographs in people's archives. And every time one of the towns is trying to write a historical book, Champlain, Beacon Town, Shazy, wherever it happens to be, they do rely on people coming forward with this great stash of photographs. And I'll take this moment, as I've done many times before, to tell people, get the pictures out if you know what the heck that is a picture of write it on the back yeah if you know what data was taken write it on the back so so our accidental historians like Jim and myself and Calvin and so many others will be able to show it with with uh, some authority as being the right thing that's great and I, and I would ask also if, if, if it's, it's we, a lot of these folks have wonderful things in their homes their family collections and what have you if you're at all inclined to share it with the world um, by all means, uh, you know, look me up uh, because uh, it, it's only through other people's generosity that we can tell this story. Uh, so much about America's historic lakes and, and the, the things that I've been able to publish is due to other people, their generosity of sharing these treasured things that they have. Um, it's wonderful to have them for your family, but if you can share those and let us publish these things and maybe eventually put them in a local museum or collect a historical society. But the bottom line is these pictures tell wonderful stories. You would still own them, but we'd be able to take share them with a much larger audience. That's beautiful. What, have you yeah. got a picture of one of the guns? Well, people have asked about the guns and these are actual illustrations from an 1850 uh, military manual showing what the actual cannons in Fort Montgomery would have looked like. And I thought people would want to know this. 32 pounders, huh? That's right. These are 32 pounders. These were, this is actually a barbette carriage. And this is the type of gun that you would see at the very top of Fort Montgomery. The barbette here was the very top, and it was designed to hold 53 of these guns. And obviously at Fort Montgomery, the area that was of most concern was the northern face. There were actually some of these 32 pounders situated up there. And you can see what happened is they would actually be on a, what was called a pintle. There was actually a swivel pin in here. And the gun would swivel on this pintle so they could take and turn it for, for a range of, uh, of fire. You can see the wheel here. 
and of course the gun with the recoil would go back onto this case. All the guns in Fort Montgomery were muzzle loading, so you actually had to take and drop the ball in from the front. And um, a 32 pounder. 32 pounder is a huge That's ball. It's a big ball. Uh, I've, I've have to uh, if you want to consider how heavy a 32 pounder is, hold a 10 pound bag sack of potatoes out like this yeah. for a while, and you can imagine how heavy a 32 pounder is. And yet, the 32 pounders. Most of the guns at Fort Montgomery were 10-inch Rodmans. These were meant to fire 128-pound balls. Yeah. 128-pound <laughs> balls. Uh, these were, of course, state-of-the-art weapons at the time. This is a case-made carriage. These are the guns that were actually uh, sat on those traverse circles, the ones that we saw earlier. There was a small wheel here, a small wheel there. These were the big guns. The uh, flanks uh, of the bastions had a very unique gun called a 24-pounder flank howitzer. These were anti-personnel weapons. Uh, Fort Montgomery had 40 of these, and they were designed to fire canister and, and grape shot. Uh, these were basically pointed down the moat, so any poor unfortunate soldier that managed to get down there would have to take and encounter these things. I always like to take and make a statement when I'm talking about the guns of Fort Montgomery, because to me, uh, people tend to minimize the importance of this fort because no battles were ever fought there. According to me, the most successful weapons are the ones that are never fired. Isn't that the truth? If you think about that, uh, the most successful weapons are the guns that are never used because they have served a purpose as a deterrent. Talk about our atomic arsenal. Yes, huh? absolutely. And Fort Montgomery, in my view, was not a blunder. It served as a deterrent, and I believe it pr helped to present to pr pr uh, prevent uh, battle and war, perhaps. Uh, so these guns were there; they were never fired in anger. But I think that's a good thing. I don't think that takes away from the value of that oh property goodness. at all. And there are other forts like that across the United States Absolutely. and across the borders, the northern border with Canada, that are well preserved today because no shots were ever fired. Absolutely. There. Absolutely. Uh, this is an interesting document from the archives of the Clinton County Historical Society. Uh, this is actually a daily report of the construction. And you can see they have a list of the, uh, the people working there. They had, on this day, uh, they had uh, 47 and a half uh, laborers there. I'm not sure about the half a laborer. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that was a half-time person or basically if somebody they just didn't do a full day's job. But I thought that was a fascinating document, basically showing the uh, materials that were brought in. This particular day they were working on the cover face, which was that enormous uh, earthen embankment. Uh, when I go out to the fort now in the course of my research, I take some of the copies of the actual plans for the National Archives. These are rather hard to see. I'm sure they're not very uh, well going to reproduce well on your camera there, but this is actually some of the plans of the barracks section. You can see the barracks rooms, the sergeant's room, the kitchens, and you can see the rifle loopholes looking out over the moat. This is the actual plan for the cover face uh, from when they were designing that in the 1840s. Um, you can see this is the postern for the fort, the entrance for the fort, but this enormous cover face was a key part of the defensive strategy. And these plans here are some of the documents that prove that the fort did indeed have guns. You can actually see, and these are armament reports. This is a, uh, showing the condition of the armament in February of 1872. It shows where the guns were and what type of guns were there. Obviously, most of them were situated on the, on the northern, northern part of the fort. And as we go on, we have documents from the 1900s. Uh, this is the lower section. You can see the powder magazines. You can see the different casemates. But all of these things are important military documents that actually show that this fort was an integral part of the plan for the defense of, 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 the, of the northern frontier. And it was not just this big monstrosity that was not it was ignored. It was, it was, it was, it was part of the, the plan. Uh, this particular uh, document is too large. Uh, so I've got it in sections, but it shows all three sections, the, the barbette tier, the casement section, and the very lower section. Um, and, of course, now we're getting into the actual uh, thing that happened in 1937. Let's talk about that. Such okay. a sad thing for me because, I, you know, m many people would dream that a great fort like this could be restored, and there was some yeah. talk about turning it into a beautiful public park. Yeah back in that day. Yeah, in um, 1937, in the, the depths of the Great Depression, um, uh, it was important for people to work. Uh, we know that there were things like the WPA, uh, the CC, uh, CCC group, 
Um, one of the things that was decided, one of these wonderful projects that was decided, was they're going to build a, a bridge across the northern end of the lake. There already was one at Crown Point. They were going to build one from Ra Alberg to Rouse's Point. And an enterprising local citizen um, decided that he was this wonderful source of material to use as riprap for the bridge. Um, he bought the fort for a song. Uh, the thinking at the time was, this is Fort Blunder, nothing good ever happened there. Uh, there were never any battles there. It wasn't historically significant. Our main objective is to get people working. And I can understand that thinking. Uh, of course, nowadays, this would never be allowed to happen, but it did. And so it's, 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 it's a really ironic situation because it did a lot for the, the, the economy and got people back to work. But in the meantime, a truly remarkable archaeological or arch architectural feature was destroyed in the process. Uh, these are photos as we go through uh, from different archives of the actual destruction of the fort in 1937. Uh, here we have some of the, this is from a uh, Delaware and Hudson brochure from 1937 showing the early stages of the demolition. We have workmen putting uh, dynamite into the actual uh, the, um, the walls. The first part was dynamited. This is actually where they were in this photo. You can see they started right here at the eastern bastion and they worked their way across. It's really ironic because the the demolition started right at the very place where the fort construction started also. Uh, this particular location right here is where the barges were brought in, where that dock was, where the stone was brought in from Isle Lamont and from Kings Bay. And as we get into this, you'll see even more remarkable uh, that they actually docked the Weston Company barges in that very same location. But the fort demolition started here and it went around. Of course, by then, all long since, all the wood and glass had been removed. Here you can see the, uh, this is another Charles Barney photo. This is the postern. They've already removed uh, the wonderful arched uh, uh, st uh, stairway, uh, uh, arch that was there. Here you have some of these uh, laborers. If you look at the size of these gentlemen's arms, I don't know if you can see that, but these people are wielding an enormous sledge. Um, this is the barrack section coming down. Uh, it would be uh, blown up. Then these fellows would get in there with their sledgehammers and they would put these, believe it or not, they would take and make these rocks into small enough pieces to go into the crusher. Uh, I'm sure they were happy to have the work, but I cannot imagine doing that uh, kind of bone crushing work. But uh, these are rather remarkable photos. These are photos from the archives of the Clinton County Historical Association. Uh, this section is still intact today. Looks pretty much like you see it today. Uh, the floors have been removed. You can see what the parade ground looks like. There is nothing left here at all. This is completely gone. This is the North Curtain. Here you can see the great um, uh, stone crushing um, tower that was erected. Um, the stone was brought up there brought up on a, uh, and dropped down for uh, putting onto the barge for a trip over to the bridge. Here you can see one of the Weston Company barges actually being uh, loaded with the stone crushed stone. Imagine that big stone being crushed into small particles like that. <clears throat> Here you can see that location I was telling you about earlier. This is where the barges would actually be brought up. Uh, here's where the fort was started. Here's where the fort was they actually ended up being demolished. This is the section from here south that is still intact. It's nowhere not as intact as it is there, but uh, these are remarkable photos of the demolition. Uh, more photos of it. You can see uh, the, the fort going down. This is a rather remarkable photo, once again, from the Clinton County Historical Association archives. Looking through the fort, uh, one of the embrasures, as they're driving the piles uh, for the bridge. You can see uh, the bridge construction starting. And I've actually been able to take and blow that up. And you can see a uh, close-up of the work. In the background, you have the railroad bridge, the railroad drawbridge. But you can see uh, the actual construction in the early stages of the uh, Ross's Point Bridge. <clears throat> uh, when Charlie Barney sent me these, uh, it literally knocked my socks off because I've seen many pictures of the fort after it was done. But I have to say that these reminded me of pictures I've seen after bombing in Europe. Uh, I think of Anzio, uh, you know. Um, how ironic it is, really, if you think about it, uh, that this, this place was never uh, attacked by an invading army. And it certainly looks like it was. Uh, this is shortly after the demolition. This is after the crews started removing their equipment. 
Uh, this is the section that is still there. Um, and of course, it's, you, we'll compare this today to the pictures I've taken recently. But this is the, um, the barrack section, and this is, of course, the, uh, the curtain. If you look at that and you compare that with, um, well, let's compare that with, uh, yeah, right here. I want to show you this, what the wall actually looked like before they took it down. I uh, showed you some pictures on the interior. And I was afraid I'd be sifting through pictures. I got too many of them. It's a, <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse. That's great. Um, but if you recall, it was a very smooth face. Sure. It was, there were a lot of windows and doors here. And all that's left now are these massive arches, which the uh, dem demolition teams didn't bother taking down. Well, people would ask, well, why are these enormous arches inside of barracks? Well, keep in mind that there were going to be 15,000-pound guns on top of these uh, barracks. So that's why those enormous arches were there. They did not bother to take them down. Here's some more pictures, of course. This is the moat. The moat was, of course, filled with debris at the time. Uh, truly remarkable photos here. This is where the drawbridge was. That's the entrance. As I look at that, I can't help but recall William Tecumseh Sherman actually went through there back in 1880 and said, this fort is so remarkable, I'm going to move the garrison from Plattsburgh up here. And of course, it didn't happen. Uh, good citizens of Plattsburgh put up such a human cry, they actually ended up staying there. But you can be sure that if there was a need to move the garrison to the fort, they would have done that in a heartbeat. But that, um, uh, that, was, uh, that was the main entrance. Um, this is another picture of the demolition. And of course, um, it's, it's almost complete at that point, looking to the north. In more innocent times, uh, young people, well, they actually have scout camperies there. Um, here we have a picture of uh, a scout group. Uh, this is in the 1950s, uh, coming through uh, the, the area. Um, this is a rather remarkable picture, I think. It's great, yeah. And we're getting into more modern pictures here. This was the moat in 1971. This is the moat today. Uh, the rest of the photos are pictures I've taken on my trip to the uh, fort of light, but it's interesting to compare these with the older pictures, and if you want to continue sure. with that. But this is the moat. You can see how it's grown up. Uh, this was, like I said, was uh, in 71. Uh, this is uh, another photo from 71. You can see that this was the, um, uh, that was the south northwestern bastion. This was the barracks section. This is what's left of one of those remarkable stone oh, uh, staircases. Uh, some of the stones are still there, but um, I've taken a lot of pictures of the stone stairways because they were truly remarkable architectural feature. Um, here we can see not only where the stairways were, but you can see the graffiti. Uh, each of these steps were staggered, of course, as you go up. This is a composite photo I've taken of three photos I put together showing the stairways that went up. This was a big round smooth. Oh, yes. Yeah, as we went up. Uh, they were truly remarkable, and I think they were early targets for the demolition team because the obviously stone came out quite easily. This is another one of them. This is the one from the northwestern bastion. The entrance was here. You can see the stairs coming down, um, but these would have been topped uh, with one of those wooden features. You can see the steps were broken off uh, neatly. This one doesn't have so much, quite so much um, uh, vandalism or graffiti on it. Uh, this is another composite photo I took. This is basically made up of two or three photos. You can see the circular um, uh, effect. Uh, these were truly remarkable things to see, and it's, it's a kind of a shame to see them in this condition today. Um, these are, this is actually the entrance to that stairway. You can see how much debris it is there now. This is the construction debris, destruction debris. But this actually would have been one of the entryways in. I mean, it's just chock full of stuff. Uh, but this is uh, the way into that staircasing, and you would uh, go up above to the uh, to There are some more photos of it. Uh, you can see the debris there. Um, this is a view from one of the uh, embrasures in the flank house here, looking down towards the moat. This is a rather unique photo. Uh, when I was there with Roger uh, last a couple weeks ago, if an invading force had actually managed to get across the cover face, across the moat, and into the what was called the postern, which was the entryway into the fort. There were rifle slits on each side of this narrow entryway, so that, and there was a door on each side of it. So not only would they have to, have to break through the doors, but if they get there, they would have been at point-blank range rifles on each side of this. You can see Roger was saying, 
I think they have to be pretty darn careful, too, because there'd be another guy on the other side there. Oh, baby. So this is the narrow entryway into the, the fort. So it's a rather unique feature. Uh, these are a couple of different embrasures um, for the, the guns. Uh, this is, like I said, the, the modern-day barracks section. It's, it's really remarkable how it's changed over the years. Um, this is the inside of what people see today uh, from the lake. Uh, another view of it. Uh, other views. This entire top section was removed. Uh, people don't see this from the lake. This is exactly the opposite uh, view of what they would see there. <coughs> this part was, of course, all removed completely. Um, this is this view here. Is that north, that remarkable north bastion which I showed earlier? And I am going to go back and I'm going to find that because that was a truly dramatic photo. And I wanted this is here. This is the same photo. Oh yes. This area here is what we are seeing here. Um, yeah, the, the destruction was almost complete on the north end. This is the southwestern bastion, the most complete part of the fort. Uh, this part is still pretty intact. The graffiti is very dramatic inside. I had to be selective as I yeah. show these to the public. I have some very real concerns about that because in 1886, uh, the War Department decided, determined that this what was called the scarf wall was separating from the rest of the fort. And so they put these enormous iron rods across. Well, these were cut in 1937 during the destruction. And so there's a very real danger, in my opinion, of this intact part of the fort falling over now. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. The settling is quite unique. Uh, there's, there's settling up on the ceiling. So what people see today, I think, is at risk also. Mm -hmm. um, this is, these are also views from within that. Here you can see uh, the ceiling settling. Uh, there's an enormous crack right down there, too. So uh, what we see today isn't necessarily going to be there for all that mm -hmm. much longer without some sort of help. This is deep inside uh, those sections. You can, the graffiti is very dramatic, certainly. Uh, these are the ovens of the fort. Um, I don't. I doubt they ever held a fire, um, but this is where they would have baked the bread for the uh, garrison. Another view of the ovens. And, of course, this is the view everybody sees from the fort. This is a close-up. And, and as I conclude this part, I want to show you basically that this is what people see. And this, of course, is that scarf wall. And my concern is, is that this wall, it was designed, uh, these scarf walls were designed to take a beating and still allow the cannons to continue firing if you open the other side. So they were basically pretty much detached. So people don't realize that on the other side of this wall, there is nothing. It's just holding uh, itself up. No it kidding. is just holding itself up. There is nothing there. I see. So how much longer it's going to continue to hold itself up, I don't know. But as you can see, this is all that's there. There's nothing down below. Um, so it's rather, rather dramatic. You can see the top part of this one's already fallen in. You can see the separation already. Of the scarf wall is falling out. So it's, here's what's happened to the north end. This could happen to the south end also. So if anything's going to happen with Fort Montgomery, I hope it can happen soon. Uh, you know. Well, when, when you say if anything can happen, what would your dream be? My dream would be that somebody sit down, a, a serious organization, uh, maybe somebody with some, some clout, I don't know, Lake Champlain Land Trust or whatever, that would be wonderful, sit down with the owners who, I mean, obviously, I've talked with them about this, this is a liability to them, that's why they've had to post this property. Uh, they're willing to work with somebody to try to, to sell this property. Um, but I, I'd love to see, I mean, they'll never rebuild this fort, but it would be ideal if they could take and use it as some sort of an interpretive uh, site. Uh, <coughs> make it, make what is, reinforce what is left. Uh, I've seen cutaway drawings. This is what you used to, what used to be here. You know, I mean, I don't know if the funds are available. I don't even know if it's practical, but the bottom line is, a lot of lessons could be learned from this. And that's what studying history does. It helps us to learn the lessons of the past. There's a lesson to be learned from the destruction of this fort. There's a lesson to be learned from the uh, uh, placing of it, the strategic location of it. A lesson to be learned from the architecture of it. 
there is we could teach with this for it. and I'd love to see what is there at least people look into seeing if they could maybe do something with stabilized it. you yeah. know Calvin and I <coughs> did what I thought was a real fun program on Hart Island and the Thousand Islands and a place called Bolt Castle yeah. it's a perfect example of what you're talking about yeah. where a man without getting to the long story built this for his wife and she died and there's quite a legend attached to it and over the years it's been an immense tourist attraction yeah. and several local organizations have combined their efforts including a lot of volunteer money to not only to stabilize it because it was never finished but to actually finish portions of it wow. as a teaching tool yeah. to show people <coughs> what it would be like had it been finished and it's made tremendous changes since Calvin and I were there and the last time we were there they had finished this beautiful um, ochre mahogany staircase wow. in the center of it going upstairs it just pleases me to go back and again yeah. and again because I went there for the first time in the 1940s and to see what those efforts have ended up with today this and, and I've been to many other sites and I'm sure you have too where some pretty rough stuff has been stabilized and goodness knows with the right effort what could come out of it well, I mean we're trying to I mean I don't want to interrupt but you got me started <laughs> we're we're trying to build a interpretive center on Plattsburgh Air Force Base we've got a transportation museum we've got old planes coming in we've got you know why not make this a part of the whole uh, the whole project is this heritage corridor that people are talking about absolutely and this could be a part of it I know money is tight and I'm not saying that something should Tim's happen here. in the first hundred thousand yeah. dollars right? <laughs> when I make it yeah yeah when, when, when all this starts to pay off for me perhaps uh, I'm not saying this should happen but I'm saying it should it should look into it you yeah. know that uh, well Victor Pod thought about that mr. pod this this fort was very very uh, dear to him and my understanding is he went to a lot of a lot of effort to try to, to have something happen with it. Um, his sons uh, still would like to have something done with it. Uh, I'm very optimistic now that they're anxious to work with me and, and make this story known. Um, they uh, Stephen attended the presentation on May 12th. They'd love to have something happen. Um, I, I would think that from a, a pure security point of view too, that instead of having this big hulking ruin there so close to the border that to have uh, something uh, much more manageable would make a lot more sense it, it's the, 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 if I can get anything across as a result of this interview what I would like to say is that this fort was not a mistake it was not a blunder it was not this big foolish waste of money it was a state-of-the-art architectural gem if you will it played a key role in the defensive strategy of, an, of the nation. It wasn't garrisoned, but that wasn't a huge deal. The bottom line is that many third system forts weren't garrisoned. They were designed to be garrisoned in the, in the event of, of war. Um, there were, have been mistakes made about this fort. In hindsight, we wish it hadn't been taken down in 1937. Um, I, I would just hate to see errors continue because this is not going to stay intact, if you want to call this intact, much longer. I believe something could be done. I'm not sure if I should say it should or not, but I'd love to see people look into it. Yeah, and, and <coughs> a lot of our good friends, uh, and you know, some are common folk like we are, and some are influential people and politicians who might want to take the torch yeah. and yeah. run with it. Yeah, uh, that's a brief primer about Fort Montgomery. Yeah. But you have so many other interests. We hardly have touched on Crab Island, and that's the subject of this wonderful book. You really are interested in that place, aren't you? For, Crab all, for all the reasons people know, and some maybe that they don't know. Well, I, what I, I tell, tend to tell people is Crab Island grabs a hold of you and it won't let go once you've been out there. Um, Crab Island is certainly very dear to me, uh, uh, Gordy, in that it's one of the it's a very significant spot not only for sentimental reasons uh, because this is the final resting place yeah of uh, some very real heroes in the early uh, years of our nation but because 
throughout history, people have tried to work on behalf of Crab Island. Uh, people, I think, of uh, military men that were stationed, uh, Oliver Edwards at uh, Plastic Barracks. Uh, people who worked like uh, Jim Bailey, who worked very hard in the 80s to get the estate to buy the property. People have worked on behalf of uh, the Catholic uh, Summer School. Those folks worked very hard oh, yeah. <coughs> uh, on behalf of Crab Island. And so the history of Crab Island is continually being written, if you will. And people are working very hard. Roger Harwood today, the, the self-appointed caretaker, John Rock with the, uh, with the flagpole. I had a small role in, in, in the website and, and putting up the book. But the place deserves better. Crab Island deserves better. Haven't and we always yeah, said that? It absolutely. deserves better. And, and, and I'm optimistic. I, I, I think now that there's this public pressure, people are talking about Crab Island. I'm very pleased to say I've been invited to speak at the Battle of Plattsburgh Festival Wonderful. about uh, Crab Island. Uh, people are, are, are learning about it. Uh, the little thing, this little book has sold well. I'm very pleased. Has it really? Yes. Don't oh you goodness. love it? Uh, for, for a local interest book, everything it's doing is very a big well. surprise <laughs> for you, Jim. Your contribution is much larger than you're willing to admit because yeah. of you're a humble guy. But it's nice to be a part of the process. It's isn't a it? wonderful thing, and, and you honestly feel like you're doing some good. You are. And like I said, just for uh, an average Joe like myself uh, to be able to make a difference is very, very gratifying, Gordy. Thank and you. you, you're involved in so many other things. We have to talk about the Valcor project yeah. too. The Valcor Bay Research Project is a truly exciting thing. I know you've talked many times with my friend Ed Scullin. Uh, you've been up to the Clinton County Historical Museum. You saw the, uh, matter of fact, just before this interview here, when I was see what I was up against, I was looking at your uh, oh, interview really? with Ed. Um, but that project is very exciting. Uh, matter of fact, Art Cullen and his crew are out there this week again with um, uh, some very specialized equipment uh, doing some, some work on the British line this time. Um, but I was very fortunate in that um, I went to a meeting of local sport divers back well, several years ago. I met Ed Scullin. And I got up there, and as I want to do, I can't stop myself. I got up there and I said, you know, I said, you guys get to see all this great stuff underwater, but those of us who don't dive don't. How about sharing some of your stuff with the rest of us? And the Valcor Bay Research Project on the web was born. Um, so I'm very, very fortunate now that Ed and and Art Cohen and all them share the results of the survey, uh, wonderful photos, underwater photos, with America's Historic Lakes, and we get to share that with the world. And it isn't just a bunch <coughs> of guys who are diving to see what things they can find on the bottom. This is uh, technically, technically oh. correct. It's scientifically sound. Yeah. They're doing it in a fashion that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So they're, and they have revealed Talk about going back in time. Yeah. They have revealed stories that are absolutely delicious, yeah. connected with the artifacts that they bring up from Lake Champlain. Underwater archaeology is coming into its own, yeah. and we're delighted that we have this resource in our own backyard. It's very exciting. Um, it's, it's really one of the nice things about this is, is this is where the, the power of the Internet has been able to play in, in, into a big role here. Because, as I, I know you discussed with Ed, uh, people have discovered the Valco Bay Research Project, and of course, because of this, other people say, "Hey, I have a piece of this too." Uh, Myron, um, uh, I'm sorry, his last name escapes me, but another gentleman from the West Coast who had actually had a descendant or an ancestor who was on the boat. Um, but there are basically people do see these things. They write in, they share. The story gets told, uh, the story of the artifacts, and better yet, the story of the people because that's what history is about. It's about the people. And that's what's so exciting about this, is we're giving them their due, if you will. You know, we're finally giving them, these brave men, their due. Isn't it wonderful? It's like the Hundley that they brought up in, in yeah. South Carolina. You feel after, you know, and I have relatives who live there, and one of my, one of my nephews is a policeman who was on the scene, yeah. took his own roll of film, as everybody did, when they brought it up. Then they send me the newspapers, and I see recreations of every face of every person that was on that. And I say, these were real people. Boy, I could feel the history. And that as always, that submarine, that that Civil War submarine, has always been fascinating. It sure me. has. And it was never found, and now it's found, and that's what we're doing every day in this dive in Lake Champlain. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things, 
and they did them here, yeah. you know. Um, and, and it's just so wonderful to be able to tell the story uh, and just tell the story properly, you know. It's, it's, it's very, very exciting, and it's tumbling too, Gordy. Uh, I'm sure you, as you, you interview all these fascinating people through the years, um, you find that it's, 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 it, 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 it's rather remarkable feeling to be able to share uh, these stories that, other, that are being brought to light and, and to be able to make history yourself by telling these tales. Yeah, these, yeah. these are all chapters in a bigger book yet yeah. to be written. Yeah. What other things are you interested in or writing about or doing? that you'd like to chat about. We know you're involved in at least six or eight what I consider very important historical organizations on both sides of the lake, and that takes up your time. Well, I, I <laughs> it's, it's really funny you say that because um, I need to start spending more time with my friends on Lake George. Uh, this is not the Lake Champlain historical site, and um, uh, Lake George is also a remarkable part of this history, and I do need to spend more time there. Um, I have worked recently with a, uh, I had an intern from St. Michael's College, a wonderful young woman named Emily Markison, who actually interned with me, and she did a wonderful story on uh, the Battle of Saratoga and the role of women, ah. and that was just published just this week, and so I've actually extended the scope of this down to Saratoga and up. My next significant project is going to be Saratoga. Um, and people say, well, what's that got to do with Lake Champlain? Well, it's got everything to do with Champlain because the Burgoyne campaign, of course, came down Lake oh, Champlain. sure it did. 15,000 strong, or maybe, that, maybe it was a little bit less than that, but uh, down the lakes, uh, stopped off of Cumberland Head. Uh, it was a remarkable thing. And, of course, they ended up in ultimate defeat at Saratoga. So to me, Saratoga is the furthest southern reaches of this, but that's another big project I'm it's working on. It's all connected. You know, Jim, <coughs> I, I sense Chapter 2 already, and we haven't even finished <laughs> Chapter 1. But our tape is running out. Yeah. I want to thank you well. for your friendship, number one, and number two, uh, for what you've sh shared with the, the North Country. I, I love people with passion. Yeah. We like to think we have it. But we, not all of us have the smarts to carry that passion into something that's really tangible, and you've done that. So thank you so much for all of your efforts. Thanks to your long-suffering wife and to mine, too. Yes. And thanks for everything you do. We can't wait for Chapter 2. Thank you so Promise? much. Promise? Promise. And who knows? Yes. Thank Jim Murray. And thanks to Jim Murray and Comfort Inn in Plattsburgh for supplying this room and the sumptuous seven-course meal that we'll enjoy <laughs> on another occasion. <laughs> and who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner.